ಸಾಯುಹಿತ್ಕುಲಿಮುಕ್ತಮೃತ as flowing rivers disappear in the sea losing their names and forms so a wise man freed from name and form attains the purusha who is the greater than the great he who knows that supreme brahman truly becomes brahman in his family no one is born ignorant of brahman he overcomes grief he overcomes evil free from fetters of heart he becomes immortal om shanti hi shanti hi shanti hi peace 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 be and all this morning our subject is evolution of vedantic thought it is a vast subject 5000 years of spiritual tradition i shall try to tell you in 55 minutes <laughs> sometimes people become proud of their family their riches their wealth a royal family the children of the royal family they are very proud of their family similarly i remind the students of vedanta to be proud of their spiritual heritage the ancient seers of truth left this spiritual legacy to us from generation after generation when we read the bible we find in the very beginning you will find in the new testament abraham begat this this person begat after 42 43 begat you will find jesus came into existence <laughs> similar concept we find in the brihadaranya upanishad in chandra upanishad they call it rishi vamsha how this spiritual heritage was transmitted from one to the other either son or disciple there is a traditional link in the ancient vedantic literature brahma the creator to this knowledge of vedanta to his son vashishta vashishta gave this to shakti shakti to parashara parashara to vyasa vyasa to shukha shukha to gaurapada gaurapada to govindapada gaurapada to govindapada to shankara then came six sects of shankara the non dualistic schools of vedanta i shall tell about shankara later so as you know ramakrishna was a disciple of a tota of a shankara monk named totapuri so when we connect our spiritual heritage we know that from where we are coming you might have wealth that wealth that money possessions somebody may rob you take away but nobody can rob your spiritual heritage and we are in doubt this ram krishna vedanta vivekananda and vedanta tradition offers this beautiful spiritual heritage to the west
first we find that in the pre-Christian era, hmm, nearly 3000 BC, 3000 BC, how this Vedantic literature evolved in India, sometimes in the remote parts of the Himalayas, in the caves, sometimes on the bank of the river, sometimes in the deep forest, sometimes in the desert. These people experimented and explored the whole spectrum of human life. Where is peace? Where is bliss? What is the source of creation? And they left their findings to us in their beautiful Upanishadic literature. I shall tell you in brief their findings. First they found that truth is one. Infinite cannot be two. There cannot be two infinites. Then one will limit the other. And the truth always tramps. Sattameva jayati nan ritam. Truth alone tramps, not untruth. Their second findings, unity in variety, in diversity, that is their second findings. They found that you see variety, multiplicity, diversity in this world. Behind this diversity there is unity. Example? The father was teaching his son, look, look, mrittika, earth, clay, is the reality. Everything you see in this world is nothing but the modifications of clay. Cups, plates, saucers, dishes, whatever you see are all made of clay. If you melt them, again it will be clay. Your earring, nose ring, armlet, bracelet, ring, all these things are nothing but modification of gold. Gold alone is gold alone is the reality. So this Brahman, this cosmic consciousness evolved in multiple forms. That they found out. Their second findings. Third findings, they are exploring where is bliss. You see, we live in this world for only one thing, bliss. People earn money for what? For bliss. They get married for what? Bliss. They want children for bliss. They want home for bliss. Bliss is the guiding force of this whole universe that they found it. Then we find in Chandogu Upanishad they are exploring what is the bliss. After 23 questions they resolved. Bliss is only in the infinite, not in the finite objects. Jat alpyam tad dukkham matameva. Whatever is a small, that is limited. That cannot be mortal. That they found out. Then they, note, they observed that this whole creation evolved from bliss, remain in bliss, merges into bliss. How to get that bliss? Well, Swami, we are trying to get that bliss, we don't get it, we get only misery, pain, suffering, frustration. Do you know why? Because we do not know how to search that bliss. The student came, asked the teacher, tell me something about bliss. Tapasa brahma vijigyasasva. First practice austerity, be disciplined, then I can tell you. All of a sudden, if I tell you, you won't understand. They practiced, they worked hard. You see, they are not talkers of religion. They practiced, demonstrated and experimented and verified, and then they talk. Sri Ramakrishna never uttered a single word without practicing that thing thrice. They are not talkers of religion. They will never cheat you. Religion is their life. It is not their business. No commercialism in Vedanta. how to attain that bliss, how to experiment, how to experience the Self, the Atman. Then they explode. Na karmana, na prajaya, na chetjaya, na dhanina, tyagi noiki amritatta manasu. Amritatta, immortality can be attained 
only through non-attachment, neither through wealth, nor progeny, nor sacrifice, nor wealth. These things will never give you immortality, because that is in the domain of maya. A clear concept, there is no ambiguity, no double dealings in Vedanta, in the Upanishadic, in the Upanishadic thought. No confusion. Truth is always direct and simple. A theologians make the think the truth, you know, complicated. Then they demanded from their students, if you want to be a student of Vedanta, you must have four qualifications. First, you learn how to discriminate between the real and the unreal. Is there anything real in this world? But Swami first define what is reality. Reality means the thing which exists all the time, past, present, and future. Show one thing in this world which exists all the time, nothing. Second, they found out, they first learned how to discriminate. Second, have self-control. Third, don't be attached to the worldly objects. Attachment invariably brings pain. Sometimes we get confused. I think that if I am not attached to my husband and wife, that means I do not love him or love her. It is a wrong concept. You see, seeing the result, you understand there are two different things. From love comes joy. From attachment comes pain. So love and attachment cannot be the same thing. They are two different things. Attachment comes satisfy me. Selfishness, self-motivated. And love, unselfish. It goes toward the object, towards the beloved. Then next is, you may be a very good person, that doesn't mean anything. You may be very moral, ethical, what does it mean? It means nothing. Do you have any desire to realize the self? Longing. Mumukshuttam, burning desire for liberation. You see, you don't feel that we are bound. The garbage collector doesn't feel the odor of that horrible garbage thing. They're accustomed, they're used to. Similarly, we are so bound, we don't feel that we are bound. A Vedanta will teach you complete freedom, because it teaches dependence brings misery, independence brings happiness. Be independent, be free. That is the main theme of Vedanta philosophy, be free. Well, how can I achieve my freedom? Well, you are already free, you only don't know it. You see, Vedantic freedom is not something you will have to get from outside. They call it prapti prapti, attainment of the attain. You are already free, you do not know it. You have a necklace under your sweater, turtleneck sweater, and you are searching around, where is my necklace, where is my necklace? It is there. If somebody puts hand under your sweater, he will find out, here is your necklace. Immediately you get joy. That is Vedantic concept of liberation. You are already free, know it. Know it right now. So, I gave you some ideas how these Upanishadic seers of truth experimented. Then, when we talk about Vedanta, we mean three scriptures, the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutra, and the Bhagavad Gita. There was an ancient sage named Vyasa. He compiled the four Vedas and taught to his four disciples. He taught Rig Veda to Poil, Jajur Veda to Vaishampayana, Sama Veda to Jaimini, and Atharva Veda to Shumantra. Four disciples learned these four Vedas. Then, he systematized the whole Vedanta. You see, Upanishad is not a systematized philosophy. Revelations came from different seers of truth, and they explored, they, 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 they told them, the disciples. He compiled them. There is no author of the Vedas. So he compiled them, and then he wanted to put a, the whole thing into a systematized philosophical form. So he wrote Brahma Sutra. It is a very beautiful book, very difficult to understand. 
potential kill with the first four aphorisms because you must know it. The first aphorism of the Brahma Sutra is Athato Brahma Jigasa. First, you be a competent student and then ask question about Brahman. Then the student asks, is Brahman is a known thing or an unknown thing? If Brahman is known thing, then I know it. I will not have to know it. <laughs> and if Brahman is an unknown thing, that I, nobody can know it, so I will not have to know it. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> then they say, well, Brahman is known to the people who are illumined, but it is unknown to the ignorant people. Then the next question came, I see the Brahman, you are talking about Brahman, there are so many contradictory things in the Upanishad, what shall we do? Tattu shamanayat. No, no, next, uh, the John, believe, what is Brahman? Believe, I, I cannot explain to you what is Brahman in the beginning, but you can see the creation, don't you? Human beings and all this cosmos, universe, believe, yes, we do. From where this whole creation evolves, that is Brahman. You see, it is not an object. Brahman is not an object. Hor holding a horn of a cow, I can say this is the cow. You cannot show Brahman that way because it is nirgun, nirakar, formless. Cool. So, we are trying to indicate that infinite through reasoning. Then came that whole creation evolved from that Brahman, so that is that supreme reality. Then came that I see so many contradictory things. Where can I know about Brahman? Believe it is in the scripture, Shastra Yunitvat, explored in the Upanishad, the revelations. Fourth aphorism, Tattu Shamanath, all Upanishads speak the same truth. Then this Vyasa wrote the Bhagavad Gita, which is the part of the Mahabharata. These three books is called Prasthanatraya. The, if you study this thing, you will understand what is Vedanta philosophy. Anyhow, before Vyasa, we find there are some sages, among some of them are women also, they mention their revelations. In the Rig Veda, we find a girl, daughter of Ambreen, experienced the cosmic consciousness within herself and also outside and declared, I lived with the gods, I am pervaded in everything and every being, I am the impress of the universe, I am the light of knowledge, the mind and the senses function due to the help of my consciousness, I am the creator of the cosmos. When the experience of cosmic consciousness comes, this type of feeling of oneness comes. Do you know why? The moment you have the experience of oneness, you cannot hate anybody. You will see yourself in everything, in every being. That is the culmination of Vedantic experience. There was another sage named Rohita. He started his journey. On the way, he f fell asleep. So Indra, God, in disguise of a Brahmin, appeared before him and said, why are you sleeping? Don't you see the sun? The sun is all the eternal traveller. The sun never gets drowsiness. Why are you drowsy? Get up, move on, march on. In the journey of your life, arise and awake and stop not till the goal is reached. You have not yet attained the goal. Move on. This sage was a fantastic, his name in the Vaitiriya Brahmana of the Rig Veda. There's a beautiful story of this Rohita. He went to drink water from the river and the Brahmins are performing sacrifice. They say, you get away from this place. This man moved toward the desert and the river followed him. At that time, all these Rig mantras are bursting forth from his lips. That is a beautiful section of the Vaitiriya Brahmana of the Rig Veda. You see, they have very beautiful tradition. Hmm? There are hundred and eight Upanishads. Then came between 500 BC to 1st century, we see in India, Buddhism, Shankha and the Yoga. These three schools of thought are predominant. Then comes the 2nd century, Gaurupada. 
he priest ajato bad you are birthless that is his philosophy the moment you can deny your birth you deny your death you deny all of you the problems of your life if you are interested you can read manjuk upanishad with karika dear he just just that really you are never born well swami i was born with my mother with parents such and such place and you say you are not born that is a story that you are born <laughs> who who what was born your body is body you that is this question body has a birth body has a death you are not the body you are the atman atman has no birth no death no disease no old age that is his philosophy everything is in the mind it is interesting his philosophy <laughs> according to gurupada the scene is always unreal the seer is real you see something in dream is it real no similarly whatever you see in the waking state is unreal it does not exist when you sleep the thing which does not exist in the beginning and also in the end it cannot exist in the middle dissolution creation bondage liberation are only mere words you are that you are the next teacher we find many teachers evolve in between then in the 8th 7th century and 8th century we find the one of the greatest teachers of vedanta which was shankara acharya 788 to 820 he lived only 32 years christ lived only 33 years this person was born in kerala in the southern part of india and at the age of 8 he took his monastic vows he left home and going to his guru govinda pada near on the bank of the river narmada in the central part of india and that guru was immersed in samadhi for many years nobody knows so this little boy of eight went to him and sang eight verses shariram surupam sadaroga muktam jashashcharu chitram dhanam merudillam guru rangi padme manushe na lagnam tatah kim tatah kim tatah kim beautiful you might have plenty of wealth many friends relatives you might have fantastic beauty but if you do not love for god what does it avail what does it avail what does it avail in this way he sang those eight verses and immediately this guru opened his eyes he was waiting for a disciple to whom he will give his spiritual heritage he taught shankara yoga vedanta and said now i shall depart from this world you teach he came to banaras then he went to the himalayas badrika ashrama where he wrote commentaries of the 11 upanishad brahma sutra gita i think 79 books he that boy wrote from 12 to 16 in 4 years and next 16 years of his life he preached vedanta all over india he established four monasteries to the four corners of vedanta of india in dwaraka in puri in badrinath and in shringeri in the south these four places <coughs> there are four vedanta monasteries to preserve the vedic culture shankara had four disciples i shall tell another story before shankara there was another teacher named kumari lobhat he is a mimamsakas who was the follower of the ritualistic part of the vedas he had a fight with the buddhists <laughs> you see it was in india that you know debate if you can if i can defeat you then you and all of your disciples will be my disciple <laughs> that is the way they used to go so shankar this kumari love hat has a he first became a disciple of a buddhist and monk and learned all the techniques of buddhism and defeated his guru then he thought of what a great crime i did it is a sinful act to defeat the guru so what did he do so his guru ordered his followers that kill that man he defeated me so they he they took him to the top of the tower and on the t- then he they threw him on the on the ground you know from the tower he declared if the vedas are untrue let me die he fell 
only got a little scratch. He did not die from the tower. Do you know why he got a scratch? Because he used that word, if. <laughs> he used the word if. If means a little doubt is there. If the Vedas are untrue, let me die. That if, that little doubt gave him a scratch. <laughs> that was Kumari Lavakta. Then what did he do? He put some rice husk, rice husk. He said, I should give up my life. So he set fire there and sat there and died. Anyhow, he was an interesting man. Shankara went there to defeat him. <laughs> Shankara went there to defeat him. He said, I am dying, so I cannot debate with you right now. But if you can defeat my disciple, then you, won, you have won. So he defeated his disciple, Manjana Mishra, and just be, he became his disciple. He had another disciple named Padma Padacharya. It is interesting to know the life stories of these teachers of Vedanta, fantastic people. So we, among the Shankara's disciples, there are some jealousy, you see. So Shankara was very partial to Padma Pada. So Shankara one day called him, he was on the other side of the lake. And as soon as he heard the Guru's voice, he just walked over the lake, over the lotus. And he got Padma Pada, that is his title. He wrote a book, Pancho Padika, a commentary on the Brahma Sutra, and he carried the manuscript for a pilgrimage in Rameshwaram, in the southern part of India. On the way, he stopped at his uncle's house, and that uncle was a ritualist. He left the manuscript with the uncle and said that, I am going for pilgrimage. After coming, I shall take the manuscript. But this manuscript, I refuted the ritualistic school, so I am keeping it with you. So what the uncle, uncle was very much upset. But this fellow, my nephew, will destroy our philosophy. So what, one night, when the nephew left, he set fire in his cottage. And the house was burnt, and the manuscript was burnt. When the, when the nephew came and said, I am sorry that my house is burnt, your manuscript is also burnt. He was very sorry. Then, well, I shall write again. Then this uncle poisoned him. <laughs> <laughs> and then Padmapada came, half crazy, came to his guru Shankara, said, well, I remember once you read that manuscript to me, I remember everything. You just write down, let me dictate the whole book to you. That way they preserved that Pancho Padika. Very fantastic story, you know. <laughs> Shankar had another disciple named Hasta Amalaka. He was a dumb person. Till the age of, I think, twelve, son of a rich man could not speak. So when Shankara came to that village, they came and they said that, could you, you are a yogi, could you help this boy? Shankara said, custom, who are you? Immediately, eight, twelve verses came from the lips. He said, Nijabodu rupu sharupu ayam atma, I am that atman, I am the self. He gave his own identity and he became Shankara's disciple. This way, Shankara had four disciples. That is 78th century. Then comes 9th and 10th century. Bhartrihari, Pachaspati, Sarvajnapa Muni. Their philosophies are fantastic. I shall tell you only some stories and some brief accounts of their philosophy. I forgot to tell this Bhartri Hari, he is a follower of Shabda Brahmavada. His life story is very interesting. He was a king. And one Brahmin, by the grace of the Divine Mother, got a fruit. And the Divine Mother told him that if you take this fruit and if you eat it, you will be mortal. So he carried that poor Brahmin, carried that fruit to his wife. That wife said, what shall we do with the immortality? We need money. <laughs> we are poor people. So he said, you carry this fruit to the king and have money from the king. So he got money from the king and he told the king, if you eat it, it would be nice, you will be mortal. The king was thinking, I am an old fellow, what shall I do? Eating this fruit, I shall be mortal. And my wife, Anangasena, such a charming queen, 
You know, she will be old and I shall be young all through. I shall see her wrinkled face. I cannot bear it. Let my beloved wife eat this fruit. The beloved wife took the fruit. Of course, of course, I eat. I shall eat it. And she had a secret lover. <laughs> <laughs> and she carried that thing to the... He, he was the uh, commander-in-chief. So she gave that fruit to the commander-in-chief. Commander-in-chief had also another secret lover. <laughs> He carried that thing to the other girl, and that other girl, you know, she was thinking she was not a very, not a moral person, very moral girl. She was thinking, what shall I do eating this fruit? Uh, fruit. I shall be immortal, and all through my life I shall do this sinful job. Ish. It is better that I don't want immortality. Let the king of this country eat this fruit. <laughs> so he carried the fruit to the king again. King immediately recognized that. <laughs> And the whole chain was caught by FBI, you see. <laughs> <laughs> then he renounced. <clears throat> he said, I don't want this world anymore. He gave the kingdom to his brother. And he became a mendicant. And he wrote three books. 100 verses on worldly life, physical enjoyment. 100 verses on ethics and 100 verses on renunciation. So Bhutri Hari's school is called Shabda Brahmabhada. He says this sound originates from silence. Again, it marches into silence. How? Do you know how? This is called Shabda Sphutabhada, Shabda Brahmabhada. For example, Ba. The moment I say ba, I created the sound, that sound vanished. Fe. Immediately that sound vanished. Lo. That sound vanished. Immediately a picture came to your mind, buffalo, an animal I saw in the zoo. <laughs> How this sound has a power to generate, to create something. Anyhow, it is a fantastic school. This say that sarvam khollu idam brahma, whatever you see is nothing but brahman. This brahman originated, the name and form originated from the sound. Watch, tree, plant, these are all sounds and immediately it takes form. So this form came from that formless sound and again it merges into sound. It, long, it is a very big philosophy, but big, big books are written on this sound, Shabda Brahma Mahal. Next teacher was Bachushputi Mishra. He wrote the commentary of Brahma Sutra. One evening he was writing and there was no light, dark, forgot everything. His wife brought an oil lamp. Then in darkness he asked, who are you? The wife burst into tears. I have no children. And even my husband, even you do not recognize me. Where shall I go? Nobody will think of me anymore. He used to, she started to cry. Then the husband said, well, don't cry. I shall make you immortal. The book which I am writing, I shall give the name of the book to your name, Bhamoti. That was the name of that woman. Generation after generation, people will remember you. Still, that is one of the best commentaries of the Brahma Sutra. That is 9th and 10th century. <coughs> in the 10th century, we find in South India the devotional school of Vedanta. <coughs> the Alvars and the Niners, they are pre prehistoric. They are tremendously mystic people, full of devotion, full of love. But in 1908, Nathamuni, hmm. <coughs> he was a dualistic, I should say, it was a qualified non-dualistic teacher. His grandson was Jamuna Charjo, another interesting Vedanta teacher. He was a his life story is very interesting. He was 12 years old, boy was studying in the house of a teacher, Bhashya Charjo. 
And at that time, you see, if I am a great teacher, if I can give it to you, that means from your income, you will have to give certain percentage to me. <laughs> so, Ulaanhala, another Vedanta teacher, defeated this Bhashacharjo, and he used to get, you know, some percentage from his income. So one day, he sent his disciple and came to this teacher, Bhashacharjo, and asked money, that you did not send money for a long time. And if you cannot pay, that used very abusive words to the teacher. And it hurt that 12 years old boy. And he challenged that I shall challenge your guru as you have scolding my guru. So he came and he was the scholar of the king. In that time, you know, the ancient time, the king used to keep some scholars in the court. And he went to that. I am just telling you, he listened. It is very interesting. <laughs> So he went to the court and he challenged this big scholar and he was only 12 years old boy. He said, I shall ask you three questions. You reply. And the, among the king and the queen, there was a debate. King says this, my, this great, great scholar will win. And the queen says, that little boy will win. Well, they had a bet. The king said, if this boy wins, I shall give half of the kingdom to this boy. So it was settled, debate started. Then this little boy, Jamuna Charjo, asked the Kulahala, the, uh, the poet, the scholar, reply, refute that your mother is a barren woman. How come? I am a son, how can I, my mother be a barren woman? Refute it. He couldn't. So he was defeated. He quoted the scripture, one son is equivalent to a barren woman, you know. <laughs> if a woman has one son, equivalent to a barren woman. He quoted some scriptures and she silenced him. Then he said, refute that this king is a pious king. And if he proves that the king is not pious, he will be beheaded, you see. <laughs> He's an intelligent, bright boy. Then he said that no king can be pious. Do you know why? One sixth of this virtue of the whole subject of the kingdom will go to the king. And similarly, one sixth of the vice also. So a king can never be perfect. He's always, you know, he may be a very pious man, but he will have to take the vice, the sinful actions of his subject, if he is a real king. So he could not refute it. So he quoted the scripture and says, the scripture says so. Then the third prove, the refute, that this, key, this queen is a chaste woman. <laughs> <laughs> then he quoted from the scripture, look, the moment a person becomes a king, eight gods possess that king. Agni, Indra, Varuna, Yama, all these gods possess that king. So when this queen cannot be a chaste woman, because these eight gods and the king, all nine people enjoy that woman. <laughs> In this way, he, he actually mercilessly defeated that scholar. <laughs> how funny. In ancient India, what, how did they fight? Eh? <laughs> then he became a king. Half of the kingdom he got. Then his grandfather, when die, while dying, sent a messenger, may my grandson may not forget God, please remind him. So a man came and secretly told him. So he left, renounced the kingdom, the throne, and he again became mendicant. His disciple was, Yamuna, was Ramanuja Charcha, who really propounded the qualified non-dualistic school of Vedanta. You see, in Vedanta there are three main schools, I did not tell you. Non-dualism of Shankara, qualified non-dualism of Ramanuja, and dualism of Madhva. These three schools are not contradictory, complementary. If you take the pictures of the sun from morning till evening, all pictures will be different, but all our pictures are connected with the same sun. So these paths, you know, these schools are not contradictory. Anyhow, Ramanuja Charja was a great-hearted person, vast heart. He's, he wanted to get initiation from your guru, and six times he was refused. Six times he was refused. He was thinking, what shall I do? 
At last he fell at his feet, and the Guru said, well, I shall give you initiation. And this initiation is very precious, I tell you. This mantra, if you repeat, you will go to heaven. And those who will hear this mantra, they will also go to heaven. But don't divulge it. Don't share it with others. So after the initiation, he went to a public place, stood on the pedestal, and there he shouted and assembled all people and shouted that mantra. <laughs> what Guru uh, forbade him, he broke the Guru's order and shouted. The Guru was very upset. He said, I forbid you and you did not listen to me. You will go to hell. But that is all right. But the people, those who have heard that mantra, they will go to heaven. You said that. <laughs> then he said, you are greater than me. I am your disciple. That Ramanuja propounded Vedanta philosophy. You see, I'll have to tell you a little bit about this dualism and non-dualism. Otherwise, perhaps you won't you will not be able to visualize it. According to Shankara, this universe, whatever you see, is called vivartha, not real transformation, apparent transformation. Example, rope and snake. In the darkness, seeing a rope, you are shouting, snake, snake, snake. The moment you bring the light, light, you see the rope as a rope. The rope never becomes the snake. So this world which you see, we say the world, you know, car, house, home, freeway, food, all these things, whatever you see, you see you are projecting. Actually everything is Brahman. That is their concept about creation. Brahman alone is real. This world is apparent. Universe, universe, individual beings are Brahman. Ramanuja says this world is the modification of the world, of, of Brahman. Example? The milk has become yogurt. It is a real transformation. That is his philosophy. Shankara denies three kinds of divisions that you should know. There are three kinds of divisions. They call it Shwagato, Veda. A tree has the root, branches, leaves, flowers, fruits, but all are connected with the same tree. This division is not in Brahman. Same, second, Shwajatya Veda. Division um, in the same species, Devda tree, pine tree, far tree, redwood tree, all these trees, all are trees, but there are various kinds of trees. That kind of divisions also are not in Brahman. Next is Bijati Aveda, trees, car, home, picture, book, all these varieties also, this variety is not in Brahman. But Shankara Bili denies all kinds of division. Do you know why? The moment you bring division, that means subject to destruction. The thing which has modification is subject to destruction. The thing which has been created is subject to destruction. So the, if you think that Brahman has been created, that means Brahman is subject to destruction. That means that is not real. But Ramanuja believes that there is first two Shajati uh, and Vijatiya, he denies. But Shagato, that you know, a Brahman, a universe is his body. Human beings are the limbs of Brahman, rays a sun and its rays. So human beings are the rays of God. That is his philosophy. I shall not go in details, then I shall not be able to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Next, another school, very interesting school. 11th century, Obhinava Gupta in Kashmir. His school is called Pratavigyabhada. Recognition. Recognition. Knowledge of knowledge. Do you know how does it work? Most people have the knowledge of God. Well, how come, Swami? You have indirect knowledge. You learned from the scriptures, you have heard from your teacher, God, such and such. This indirect knowledge we have, but we don't have direct knowledge. This school says that recognition is very important. I am Brahman. But I don't recognize myself as Brahman. Why? Because I am not aware of it. Awareness, self-awareness, that is his school. It's very important. He gave a very good example. A woman asked her lover to come at night. She has a secret lover. You come and 
stand uh, the wait for me uh, under the apple tree in my backyard. But so that man came and it was dark night. She saw somebody under the under the tree, but she could not recognize that it was her lover. So that recognition is not there. So fear dwells in his mind. The moment he sees that person's face, the moment he recognizes, fear goes away. Immediately, her love comes to for that person. Until and unless he recognizes, her love does not come. Similarly, that God is always within me, but I do not recognize. How to get recognition? Hey, that is his school. How to get it? Practice. Practice. Repeat the mantra. I am Brahman. I am Brahman. Remove this indirect knowledge. This, this remote thing, you know, then you will experience it. There was another school, Nimbar Kocharjo. He is also 11th century. His school is called Veda Aveda Vada. Brahman is, has division and also no division. Example, a consciousness and unconsciousness both are in the body. This physical aspect is unconscious, matter, but there is pure consciousness. So it has a division and also it has no division. He was talking about very interesting life. He is called Nimbarko Acharjo. He was talking about God in the evening, and it was late evening, the person with whom he was talking, he was a Joino. Joino people never eat after sunset. Never, they will never touch any food. So while talking about God, they forgot everything, and then he was very much sorry. Shh, we talked about God, and this man will fast in my place, will not eat anything. He felt so bad. Do you know what did he do? He was thinking, he prayed to the sun god. You come and appear above my house so that this holy man can have some food. So the sun god said, all right, I shall stand on the top of the margosa tree and I shall put light only on the plate of your holy man <laughs> and let him eat it. And that he did. So that person could eat some food. So he got his Nimbo means Margusa tree, Orko means sun, Acharjo. That was his name. Interesting. He says Guni and Gun and Guni of it. Gun means quality. Guni means the person who has that quality. For example, Ruby Shankar and his and his art of music, Shita, that is his quality, that music which he produces. So these two are identical, that is his philosophy. Quality and the person are identical. So God and his infinite qualities are identical. The qualities are always different. Ravi Shankar's music is apart from Ravi Shankar. That is his school of thought. It is interesting. <laughs> In the thought, then there are some Vedantic teachers, they wrote some dramas to propagate Vedanta philosophy. They are not dry people, I tell you. <laughs> Sri Krishna Mistra Jyoti, 11th century. He <clears throat> wrote a drama named Prabhu Chandra Daya. Sri Ramakrishna mentioned about these things in the Gospel and Swamiji also mentioned. You see, he made two kings, ignorance and the Viveka. These two kings, they had a fight. The disciples of ignorance, he take all human emotions, human feelings, and portray them as a human character. Lust, anger, jealousy, hatred, delusion, passion, all these beings are the disciples and the soldiers of ignorance king. And devotion, faith, love for God, all these things, you know, are the, disciples, are the soldiers of the king Viveka, and they had a fight to capture Kashi, Banaras, the city of Larni. So Viveka was defeated. The uh, ignorance, the king ignorance occupied the city of Larni, and whole culture went down. Then this defeated party was plotting, planning how to defeat the ignorance. They said, you know, after long deliberation, they found out that we need a powerful soldier. Well, who is that soldier? Well, Prabodha. Perfect knowledge. How will it come? 
Well, you, Bibika, you should marry. To whom? Upanishad. So he married Upanishad and got a son named Prabodha. And this Prabodha, with perfect knowledge, conquered ignorance and again recaptured the city. You know, through drama, they depicted this Vedantic thought. Fantastic book. I wrote two articles on that many, many years ago. In the 13th century, we find Madhva, the dualistic teacher of Vedanta. He sees that God and human beings are separate. We are all servants of God. We must worship God. And how to attain devotion? Devotion is the only way. He did not care too much about the path of knowledge. He says how to attain devotion. Hmm. Brahma is with qualities. Human beings are the servants of God. This world is real. You must practice devotion, non-attachment, meditation, self-control, studying the scriptures, give up comforts, be indifferent to fear and surrender to God. Shiva. How to serve God? Let's try to meditate on Him, love Him, worship Him, put marks on your body so that you can think of God all the time, keep the name of the children's name also, you know, God's name so that you can think of Him. In this way, he put ten items how to get the deep impression of God in the mind. You see, if you have deep, deep devotion, then you will get constantly collectedness of God. That is his school. In the 14th century, we find another Vedanta teacher in the south, Vidyaranya Muni. He was the Shankaracharya of the Sringeri Mart. He was a minister. If he was a mendicant, then he became a minister, established Vijayanagar kingdom, and defeated the Mahamajans, and saved the Vedanta culture, and wrote some fantastic books on Vedanta, such as Jivan Mukti Vivika, Panchadashi, and many other books. Those books are fantastic, beautiful books. He defended the Vedanta philosophy. In the 15th century, Chaitanya brought Achinta Veda Veda Bada, inscrutable dualistic monism. He preached in this Kuli Yuga, chanting God's name is the only way to realize God. He mentioned five things to attain devotion. Holy company, worshipping the Lord, studying the Bhagavatam, devotional scripture, chanting God's name, and living in a holy place. His disciple Jiva, formulated Chaitanya's philosophy. Then in the 18th century, I found, we find another interesting Vedantic teacher named Sadashivendra Jogindra. His life story is very beautiful. He was a quite argumentative person. He loved to defeat people through arguments. So what did he do? One day his disciples, his guru said, when are you going to stop? This argumentation, there is no way you can realize God. Please, close your mouth. So he closed. <laughs> he closed it. He never talked anymore, all through his life. So one day he was lying down under a tree. He was going somewhere. He was a yogi, lying down under a tree and putting a brick, as a, making a brick as a pillow. So the village women were going, passing by for taking water from a pond or some lake. So these women said, well, he has become a monk and you need a pillow. <laughs> he has a brick. 
put a brick as a pillow, he was lying down. Huh? He needs a pillow. Huh? What type of monk is this? So these village women left. Then when they are returning, after fetching water from the pond, he, in the meantime, he threw away the brick and lay down just on the ground. Then the women are saying, eh, this monk is very sensitive. <laughs> this monk is very sensitive. I just criticized him and said, what type of monk he is, needs a pillow, a brick. <laughs> and he is so sensitive, he has a big ego. So that he was telling, you cannot satisfy anybody in this world. <laughs> If you go this way, they will criticize you. If you go this way, you will criticize you. There is no way, follow your way. Ask your conscience and do what is right. One you see in India we find these types of teachers, you know, they want to argue to to establish their supremacy among the scholars. They are very interesting people. <laughs> In the 19th century, we find Ramakrishna, who was the embodiment of the Vedas and Vedanta. He himself said, my experience even surpassed the Vedas and Vedanta. When we read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the Ramakrishna, the great master, we find what, what a colossal experiences we find a single life. You will never find a single person in the religious history of the world. Somebody said to Swami Vivekananda in Madras that you know this dualism, non-dualism and qualified monism, all these schools are not contradictory, they are one. No other teachers previously said that. Swami Vivekananda said, because it was waiting for me. My guru was the embodiment of all religions. He experiences various kinds of religions and proclaimed as many faiths, so many paths. Without any education, Sri Ramakrishna demonstrated to the modern world that this, which is possible to experience that cosmic consciousness without any education. Anyhow, I have no time to tell you more. I am not happy to tell you the... because I gave six lectures <laughs> on this topic as a series. I just put all them in one lecture, it is not good. <laughs> But at least I wanted to give you a full picture that how these thousands of years, how these people thought about Vedanta, wrote their philosophy, wrote many books, thousands of books, and how they preserved their Vedantic culture. Do you know why? A two forces are constantly fighting, materialism, spiritualism. The moment materialism is rampant in the society, you will find selfishness. fight, struggle, problems. You know, all these problems begin in the society. The society becomes chaotic condition. When spirituality is predominant in the society, peace, joy comes to the society. It is the, you know, these two forces are constantly fighting. So the Vedantic teachers are trying to bring the spiritual culture up. The moment your mind is high, you will find you have few problems you have. Problem comes when the mind is in the bottom plane. So this Vedic culture will raise your mind up, will make you free from superstitions, narrowness, bigotry, will give you the experience of the freshness of the eternal. Thank you. Shuddhantam Jyoti Raham Viraja Vipakma Bhuyasam Antaratmami Shuddhantam Jyoti Raham Viraja Vipakma Bhuyasam 
परमात्मा मई शुद्धं तम ज्योतिरहम विरज भी पापमा भूय सम ओम शांति 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 मे माय बॉडी बी कम प्योर मे आई बी फ्री फ्रॉम इम्प्यूरिटीज एंड इग्नोरेंस मे आई रियलाइज माय सेल्फ एज द लाइट डिवाइन मे माय माइंड बी कम प्योर मे आई बी फ्री फ्रॉम इम्प्यूरिटीज एंड इग्नोरेंस मे आई रियलाइज माय सेल्फ एज द लाइट डिवाइन मे माय सोल बी कम प्योर मे आई बी फ्री फ्रॉम इम्प्यूरिटीज एंड इग्नोरेंस मे आई रियलाइज माय सेल्फ एज द लाइट डिवाइन पीस 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 बी एंड फोर्थ 